What if I told you that as I walk across the stage right now, I am moving slower through time than you are? Or similarly, what if I told you that when I jump up on my way up right there, I was actually shorter than I am currently? Well, you'd probably think I've gone mad because <laughs> that doesn't exactly make a lot of sense. How can we move slower through time just by walking? And yeah, you, you would be justified in saying that because we don't exactly see this sort of thing in our daily lives. But a common theme when we look at the universe is that if we look at extreme cases beyond just the daily life, then the laws of physics don't actually behave as we might expect them to. And there's a few examples, and I'm going to focus on one today, which is described by a theory called the special theory of relativity. It was invented by a lot of people, a theory in science is rarely invented by just one person, but primarily by a German fellow who looked a bit like that, you may have heard of him before. Um, <clears throat> And it, what it deals with is all about movement, as you may have guessed. In other words, it answers the question, what happens when I go really, really fast? And uh, a few things that happen. If you move fast enough, you age slower. You get shorter if you go upwards or in any direction. Um, you can't travel faster than light, which is a thing we tend to all sort of know about just from hearing it. But uh, this theory is the thing that proved it, and I don't think I have it on this slide. But it also uh, spawned one of the most famous equations in the world, which you'll soon see at the end. And hopefully by the end of this talk, those three facts should make at least a bit more sense to you. Right, uh, that said though, before I go into any of the fun stuff, there is a few stuff, things you have to go over before that, because so you can actually understand what this theory is doing. So when we're crafting a theory in physics or in anything, uh, you need basically a starting point. And in physics, they have a fancy name. They're called postulates. Uh, something that you accept to be true, and then you build your theory off of it. And you don't necessarily have to prove it, by the way. Although, that said, if it's disproven at a later date, then your whole theory is invalid. So you want to be pretty sure they'll hold. And thankfully for Einstein, they did. There are two of them for special relativity. And I think the simplest thing to do is just go through each individually, and then I can get on to the fun stuff afterwards. So. Without further ado, the first postulate is called the principle of relativity. It was invented a good 300 years before Einstein decided to look into this theory, and it states that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference. Right, what does any of that mean? <laughs> um, the first part should hopefully make at least a bit of sense, and if it doesn't, I'll come back to sort of, it, sort of at the end. It's those last four words there, I think, which would cause the most confusion. I mean, what's a frame of reference, and what does it mean to be inertial? And I'll just explain that now. Um, a frame of reference is basically a fancy physics term for point of view. So if you take something, say I'll use me for this example, and you look from its point of view, you can say, another way of saying that is you're in that object's frame of reference. So if you look from my eyes, so to speak, you're in my frame of reference. And the thing that we choose to look from has a special name. It's called the observer. But it's not just called that for the sake of naming things. It's, there's a very special property about the observer, which is at the heart of what this postulate is saying, which I'll explain using a simple example. This would work. Oh. OK. So uh, here we have a rocket that's going to fly past a planet. And importantly, what I'm about to show you here is the exact same thing, just viewed from two different points of view, or as we now know, frame of reference. So in this first one, the rocket's just going to fly past Earth. And imagine you're looking at it. You imagine you're standing on Earth looking at it fly by. Not too big of a surprise. I mean, the rocket flies to the right. Wow, so exciting. Um, and then in this second one, important. this is important. If you imagine in this one that you're looking out the window of the rocket as you fly by the planet, watch the difference. Did you notice there that the rocket didn't move? And that's not just a trick of the eyes either. When I was programming these animations, I had to specifically tell it the rocket doesn't move and the planet does. And importantly, in this one, we're looking from the rocket's point of view. In this one, it's the Earth's point of view. The Earth and the rocket are the observers in the scenarios where they don't move. And that is a very important fact. When you take anything to be the observer, its speed is always considered to be zero. The observer never moves. And this can seem a bit weird at first, because what it's essentially implying is that as I walk across the stage here, there's two ways you can look at that. You can either say, from your point of view, or from your frame of reference, I'm moving and you guys are all stationary. Or if you take it from my frame of reference, I'm stationary and the whole world is moving backwards. And as weird as that sounds, what this postulate is saying and what I want you to understand is that 
nothing actually changes in either of those scenarios. Like, even, whether you take it so that I'm walking and you're stationary, or you're, st you're uh, moving and I'm uh, not moving at all, I still end up in the same place. So if I walk from here to here, if the world had moved back, or if I had moved forward, I still get from point A to B. And that's exactly what this theory is saying. Regardless of what you choose as the observer, the way in which objects move does not change at all. And the way in which objects move is just the laws of physics. And there is a small caveat to this, which is the word inertial. Uh, all that essentially means is that the observer, its speed doesn't change. So if I start accelerating and running quickly, then this postulate will not apply. And there's an everyday example you can use to make sense of this, which is essentially, imagine you're just in the car. If you slam on the accelerator, you're going to feel yourself get pushed back. Uh, and that is the exact thing that this, this postulate is no longer applying. But if you are moving, just cruising along at a normal, like a constant speed, you aren't changing, you can physically treat that scenario as if you are not moving at all, and it's completely impossible to tell the difference. Right, so there's the first postulate done, and that was all well before Einstein decided to mess things up. Um, and the second postulate is what causes all the weird stuff to happen. And to explain it, we essentially have to take all that stuff and ask one simple question. What about light? Uh, to put it simply, light is not as simple as, nor as applying it to normal objects, because according to other theories that had been invented beforehand, the speed of light was shown to be constant, or in other words, it never changes. It always stays at the same value of about 300 million meters per second. But importantly, as the, co the concept of a speed that never changes is actually directly contradicting what I've just explained. And let me explain that, because what the principle of relativity is saying is you can make any object be not moving and the same thing, like everything, nothing changes, the same scenario will occur. But that's essentially saying the concept of speed is entirely subjective. Regardless of, like, you can measure the speed as I'm walking across here. From your frame of reference, I'm moving across the stage. But remember, from mine, I am stationary and the entire world moves backwards. So I actually measure you guys as moving. So we can have two different speeds that, according to that previous postulate, are equally valid. So how can light always stay the same? And what Einstein basically says was, all right, screw all that other stuff, it just always does. <laughs> so light, the speed of light basically, the, the second postulate says the speed of light, or C as it is up here, stays the same in any reference frame. So no matter where you look at it from, it will always move at the same rate. However, um, as you may imagine, this does not come without its fair share of problems, one of such which is here. So in this example, you've got lovely rectangular me um, looking at this box of light. And Again, just the two scenarios to show the different frames of reference. Um, in this one, I'm not moving and neither is the light, so that box is just going to shoot the beam of light upwards. Nothing too exciting there. But importantly, this second example, I'm going to hop in the rectangle mobile and I'm going to start moving that way. From my frame of reference in this, remember, the observer never moves in the frame of reference, so the car is going to stay stationary and the light box is actually going to move backwards. And watch what that does to how the light moves. Do you see what happened there? As the light goes up, the box moves to the side, so it keeps doing that in a sort of staircase-like pattern, and it traces out that diagonal. But importantly, remember, these two are the exact same scenario, so the light takes the same amount of time to travel that distance in both cases. But can you see in this one, that you can prove it using maths or just by looking at it, this is clearly longer than this. But how can it travel a longer distance in the same amount of time if, according to this very postulate, its speed is meant to stay the same. And, well, quite simply, the answer is it can't. That's not something that's mathematically impossible. And so we have a paradox on our hands, and we need to solve this paradox if our theory is going to do anything. And the way that Einstein chose to do so was quite elegant, at least in my opinion. He basically said that if the speed of light is going to always remain the same, and if the principle of relativity is going to hold, which had been proven to do so multiple times in the past before this, then the very quantities with which we measure speed, those being distance and time, they have to be the things that change based on where we look at them from. And this is where the fun begins. So I'll start with time because it's more well known. The phenomenon is called time dilation, and it's commonly summarized just by the phrase, moving clocks tick slower. Or to be more accurate to the maths behind it, that would show up, um, 
if I move like this, you see me as moving. So if you count to one second, more time will have passed for me, and so I'm moving slower through time. And I, I have been trying to omit the maths from this talk um, for your collective sanity as much as I can, but I do genuinely think that it will help with your understanding here. So this here is the formula for how you calculate time dilation. Uh, T just being how time passes for the observer, T prime or T dash or whatever you want to call it, that's time for the moving object. And this weird looking Y thing here, it's called gamma or sometimes the Lorentz factor. Um, it has a mathematical expression, it's one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, but do not worry about that. Um, it's essentially just a numerical expression of how fast are you going compared to light. So if you're going really quickly, gamma will be bigger. If you're not, then it won't be. I think at 1% the speed of light, it's about 1.01. .01. So one second for the observer is one second times gamma, times gamma seconds for the, uh, for the moving object. So it might be one second to the observer is 1.01 1 .01 seconds, or so on. And an important thing to note is that this does not become nearly significant enough to be observable at everyday speeds. You can see I put an example there. At 120 kilometers an hour, light is, or time is slowed down by uh, that much percent. I'm not going to read that out. I think you can appreciate that as a very small number. Um, and finally, just one other note. Um, you yourself, as the observer, will never experience the effects of time dilation on yourself. And the reasoning comes back to the first postulate. If I'm walking here like this, remember, I am the observer, and so my speed is considered to be zero. So I will never experience time dilation, because remember, that gamma is only going to affect it if an object is moving. It's how fast you're moving relative to light. And so what you will actually see is, remember, the entire world moves this way and I stay still. So you'll see the entire world get slowed down in time. Whereas to an outside observer looking at a moving object, they would see that thing slowed down. So there we go with time. Uh, and there is, there is a space alternative to this, as the title may suggest, and it's called length contraction. Uh, and it actually follows quite nicely on from time dilation. And I'll explain it yet again using, using an example. So I've got this rod here, and I want to see how long is this rod, ignore the label I've put on it. Uh, I could do this like with a meter stick, like a normal person, but I'm a physicist. I want to do it the weird way and see what happens. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to get a clock and I'm going to slide it across the rod at a constant speed. And basically say, the longer it takes for it to cross the rod, the longer the rod is. Simple enough. Is what I would say if we hadn't just proven that time is different if you're moving. So let's have a look and see how that affects this. So in this first example, weird as it might seem, I'm going to say I'm standing on top of the clock or running along with it or doing something so that I'm in the clock's frame of reference. And so as I move along the rod, I'm going to measure some value, say five seconds, and that's how long the rod is, so to speak. But in this one, I'm going to look at it from the outside on the rod and see as the clock's moving. But remember, moving clocks tick slower. And so this clock will actually read a larger time than this one. But if I'm measuring how long the rod is with how long it takes for the clock to move across, which is mathematically valid, how can one be shorter than the other? Again, we have a contradiction in that one would have to be a shorter length than the other for the amount of time to actually make sense. And what this basically implies is that if you're moving, you are shorter. If I walk like this, I get contracted like that. If I go up, I get contracted like that. In whatever direction you're moving, you get sort of squished, like if you get like a Google image and squish it like that, in that sort of direction. And um, once again, similarly, to the same stuff applies as time dilation. To a moving object, everything else around it is contracted. So you see the entire world in a sort of like squished state. But to, if you were looking at something moving past you, you would see that get squished as you, would have, as you saw with the rod. Okay, uh, and that's illustrated quite nicely in this diagram here where you've got, and this is the other guy's from a reference, as I move, he sees me as like moving and so I get contracted. But then here in the same scenario, but from my frame of reference, as I move along the road, the other guy moves the other way and he is the thing that gets, gets contracted. And the same thing applies to time dilation. Right, so uh, with those two little things in our tool belt, we can now say, definitively explain why exactly this thing happens. So, um, in this one, it's, again, it remains not too interesting uh, because I'm in the same frame of reference. It just takes some amount of time for the light to go up. 
But in this second one, remember, I am moving relative to that, to that device that's shooting out the light, which means that since moving clocks take slower, that light actually has more time for me to travel that extra distance because, remember, I am moving and so the, the time will be slower. And at the same time, the length it has to travel will actually be shorter because of length contraction. Right, so there's the space and time stuff done, but those are all dealing with how close can you get to the speed of light, and all the weird stuff that happens then. But a question you may ask is, okay, well, what happens if we can go even faster? What happens if we reach or even exceed the speed of light? Is that even possible? And to look at if it is possible, we have to look at a little thing called energy, which is frustratingly difficult to define, but uh, the best way I think I can say it is, it's the or kinetic energy specifically, it's the capacity of an object to change how it moves over a certain amount of time. So if you have a lot of energy, you can change how you move or your speed, acceleration, whatever, easier than you can if you had less. And this here, uh, I could go into a whole lot of maths to prove what you're about to see, but I don't think any of you would be too interested in that, so I'm just gonna show you the final result. Who recognizes that? It's possibly the most famous equation in the entire world. Um, However, and there's a lot of stuff to go into about it, which I sadly don't have time to do. But what if I were to tell you that isn't the full thing? That's actually a special case of what the real equation is, which is E equals MC squared gamma. And this here is what we use to prove that we can go faster, that we can't go faster than the speed of light, sorry. So basically, the thing I um, didn't explain earlier about gamma is that as your speed gets closer and closer to that of light, um, gamma continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's no bound to how big gamma can get. The closer you get to the speed of light, gamma will keep growing and keep growing up to infinity. And once you get to the speed of light, then it is infinity. And so you can see here, you have mc squared times infinity is the energy you would need. And essentially saying you need infinite energy to accelerate to the speed of light. And, well, there isn't infinite energy in our observable universe, so we can say with a decent amount of confidence that it is, in fact, not possible to travel at the speed of light or beyond. And right, there you have it. Uh, we've seen a whole load of weird stuff happen, um, from time messing up to space getting shorter to fundamental revelations about mass, light, t uh, mass, light, energy, and a whole bunch more. But what I really love about this theory, personally, is that it all stems from just one simple question. What happens when we go really, really fast? And well, the answer to it, when you go really, really fast, time and space become relative. And with that, my name is James Whelan, and I thank you all for listening to my TED Talk.